Thank you very much. And let me thank the organizers for organizing this very nice conference and for inviting me. Unfortunately, I couldn't be here for the first part of the, the first four days. Uh, and so the, my, my, my talk is the last one. On the plus side, I don't have to spend time in trying to motivate why the easy, the easy model is so important because you, you already heard about it. So I can just jump into the, the juice of, of the talk. Um, so what I would like to do in this, in this seminar is to, well, give you a flavor of what is conformal bootstrap and how it has been used uh, in the last 10 years, basically, to extract information about the uh, three-dimensional easy mode. And so to start, uh, let me start by trying to pass the main, uh, the main idea of conformal bootstrap in a very sim uh, simple example, which has nothing to do with, uh, with the easy model. But nevertheless, in my opinion, it's very illuminating. So the easing model, uh, in a sense, for us, is like uh, the harmonic oscillator of conformal field theories. Uh, is, the, is the model where you try to test all your ideas, right? So, uh, oscillator of CFTs. And very much like the harmonic oscillator, it has various limits and various cases where you can solve things. And so you're anticipating that the easing model really is conformal also in dimension three or so. I'm yeah, that would be my assumption. Yeah. But I'll, I'll go to that in, in, a, in 10 minutes. Before, let's try to uh, develop a sort of philosophy of how to, we can approach the problem. And so very much like the harmonic oscillator, the, the easing model in two dimension, taught as a conformal field theory indeed, uh, it's, uh, it's very nice, it's solvable, we know basically everything about it. And so we can in a sense relate this to really the pure harmonic oscillator in quantum mechanics, where you can solve everything, right? Uh, you know the spectrum, you know the eigenfunctions, you know everything. If you, try to start the, if, if you try to study the harmonic oscillator in a different limit, for instance, in 4 minus epsilon, as we heard this morning, okay, this, this theory is uh, perturbative, and so you can use perturbation theory. And so in a sense, you can relate this to uh, the harmonic oscillator plus a certain correction, let's say a quartic interaction, with where the four. Thank you very much. Uh, where the scaffolding in appropriate units is very, very small. And so you can develop perturbation theory using standard perturbation theory techniques, and you can compute the first few corrections. For instance, the ground state energy will receive uh, order G square correction, and so on and so forth. You can compute them order by order. And then if you are powerful enough, you can perhaps uh, compute a lot of them, and then Borel resum them, and find uh, Finite the results. And so the three dimensional easing model instead is a strongly coupled theory. It's very hard to, comp to, uh, to do anything about it. So, in a sense, we can relate this to, again, the harmonic oscillator, where now our quartic interaction is a strongly coupled one. So, G, the coupling G, is order one. And so, how do we? tackle a problem like this one. As I said, uh, you, can, you, you can perhaps imagine that you can develop a perturbation theory around the point where G is very, very small, and then perhaps resum it. Of course, this model is simple enough that you can actually solve it in many other ways. Uh, you can even solve numerically the, the Schrodinger equation. But, but that's not the point. The point is that uh, this model is a, a model that you can be studied in various ways. And the bootstrap is a particular approach that you can develop to study such a, such a model and such a theory. So let me try to exp <laughs> explain one possible way of studying the anharmonic oscillator, which is due to a recent paper by uh, Han Hartnell and uh, Kratov. Let 
graph uh, of a uh, couple of years ago, I think. Um, so consider, so we try, we're trying to study this, this problem in, in the regime where g is order one. And in particular, we can take g equal one, just for, for, for simplicity. So what I want to try, I would like to develop a method that uses, in a sense, consistency condition of this, of this model and allows us to uh, extract quantitative information, for instance, about the ground state. Alexander, you yes. talk maybe the first one, or maybe one of the first ones which mentions quantum mechanics in this context. <laughs> so you shouldn't assume that if you write h equals p squared plus x squared, we know what you do. OK, very good. Well, but OK, quantum mechanics is part of uh, mathematical courses, I guess. So, uh, so uh, very good. Uh, so this is the Hamiltonian of, of a problem. And OK, this is the coordinate, and this is the conjugate momentum. So Do you have Planck constant? There is no Planck constant. Quarm. Quarm. It, yeah. Um, good. And yeah. This is just a real number? So these are operators. These are operators acting on an Hilbert space. X, the position operator. And P is the, is the conjugate variable, so it basically is the derivative. It has an implementation in terms of derivative. So there is a, there is a commutation relation between, between these two. So X is the multiplication of the rate. Yes. Ah. <laughs> yeah, X is the multiplication operator. And P is the derivative operator. And this defines the, the quantum harmonic oscillator. So uh, that would be the, the same Hamiltonian you would find in classical mechanics, but at the quantum level. But you're just making an analogy, right? I'm just making an analogy, so you, you, you don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to study this. Just trying to make a point. And the point is that, uh, so this, this, uh, uh, so this operator acts on an Hilbert space. Uh, on the Hilbert space, you have a, a positive norm. And so if you consider generic state of an Hilbert space, it has to be positive. So let me try to construct the generic state of living on this Hilbert space, which can be, for instance, written in this way, a sum of a certain coefficient and going from zero to capital K of um, certain coefficient, Cn, uh, this, this operator x elevated to the power k, to the power n, acting on the ground state of the problem. So this problem has a, has a ground state and energy levels. Okay, so this is a particular state, and we would like this object to have a positive norm, so we would like to require things like this. Okay, so now for any basically choice of coefficients, because this is a generic state. So if you try to impose x is the operator x. So it's not our problem. It's a sub function in front of E0. So no, it's not a function. This is the operator that gives you the. Hmm? If it's diagonal, it's sub function, right? These are, the exact, these are again states of the Hamiltonian. Okay. So, these are a, so these are again states of this operator H that you, can, you assume that you can diagonalize. And these are other operators in a sense. When, when they act on any state of the operator, it gives you the, yeah, it's a function. Don't you have to have the operator on the other side too? No. No. It's the operator acting on a state to give you a state. And we want this positive or just non negative? I want this to be non negative. No, but that's generically. automatic. Since you're running on a Hilbert space. It is automatic, yes. Yeah. In a sense, it's a, it's, it's a condition. It is automatic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is automatic, but there is some there is a non-trivial uh, condition that you can get out of this uh, this this of this one this relation. In particular, okay, so this is this is uh, positive. The positivity of this is equivalent to the positive to the semi-definite positive positiveness of the following fun of the following metric. So uh, expect expectation values on this state. 1, 0, 
expectation value on the same state of operator x to the k, zero, whatever, and then, okay, there are, there are so many, many, and then expectation value on zero of x to the 2k uh, is zero, right? So if this is semi-definite positive, then definitely the state is gonna be positive. Um, now, so far I haven't done basically anything, but using commutation relation of this, uh, of this, of, of this operator, and I, a very nice uh, relation you can, you can obtain is that you can relate any entry of this metric for k larger than or equal than three, you can express any of this entry in terms of the energy is zero, and a a uh, one of them, for instance, the smaller non-trivial one is this one. And this, uh, in, in doing this, we are using the explicit form of the Hamiltonian H. So there is a, an ingredient that we are injecting in the theory. So there is a consistency condition and a dynamical ingredient that we are using. And if you do that, okay, uh, you can check, basically, you can, specific, you can fix uh, the energy, you can fix, you can assign a value to this, to this quantity and check numerically, literally, or even non-numerically, uh, if this object is semi-definite positive or not. And if you do that, you will obtain an exclusion plot in the space of energy and this expectation value. Let me just write it x squared. So, of course, this problem can be solved exactly, so you know exactly what the solution. But the nice thing is that... What is, what is the coupling to the coupling G? Coupling G I fixed to one. Okay. Yeah, this is for G equal one. It has to be ordered one, so I just fix it to one. But then you cannot solve it exactly. You can solve it numerically. There's a Schrodinger equation associated to this. Uh, it's an eigenvalue. Uh, equation, and you can solve it numerically to arbitrary precision. But the nice thing is that for any point in this plane, you can just check if this metric is semi-definite positive or not, and you will find values, surprisingly, you will find values that where this metric is not semi-definite positive, and values where it is. And so you, and depending, and of course this depends on how many states you include, sorry, how many uh, operate, how many coefficient you include in this combination. So you can always enlarge it and, and make it make a stronger condition. So for instance, for you get a shape like this for k equals seven, you get a shape like this for k equal eight, you get a shape like this for k equal nine. You're optimizing over the coefficients, the choices of coefficients? I'm optimizing uh, I mean, you get to choose any C's. Yeah, exactly. So the point is, is exactly this one. For certain choices in this, part, in this plane, there is no choice of, of I mean, there are, there are choices of C where this object becomes a negative, which is something you don't want. So, well, if the matrix, be, if you put it here, the matrix becomes non-semi-definite positive, which means that there are choices of vector where the, the state has negative norm. <laughs> Why not? Question? Yes. How do you relate the k moments to the second moment? Yes. So uh, you have. So basically, you have to use the fact that the expectation value of the Hamiltonian with the self-adjoint operator on this on any state of the Hamiltonian is zero. It's just a trivial statement. And using various choices of this operator, for instance, x p, x to the s p. You just iterate and so so the point of this exercise, um, however trivial it is, is to show that there are there are various ways of approaching a problem, uh, and you can use you can devise self consistency self you can devise a method that uses self consistency conditions, and it is improvable, right? Because you can always improve this. So the bounds that you get out of this uh, of this exercise can only shrink by increasing a k. And that's exactly something that happens in the conformal booster. So we will... Well, how in k can you go? And which is the... Zero? Well, this is a metric k by k, so the bigger your computer, the higher you can go in k. Can one prove that you go to the point? Hmm? 
Does it converge to a point? When yeah. I don't know. I, uh, the, I have, yeah, I mean, it shrinks more and more. Yeah. Hopefully it does, but I don't know. If you cannot distinguish it's your free, how's I can play this on this base map? I think it will be around pitch again. Yeah, yeah. Yes, you can do it also for higher, uh, higher yeah, games. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So this was this was a, this, this method was devised to to study matrix uh, matrix uh, quantum mechanics, which is not solvable very easily. All right. So let's now try to uh, divide well to to generalize this to a more complicated problem, which is solving the easing mode. Um, so I'll try to, I will try to explain how a similar approach can be taken to study uh, a conformal field theory. So for me, I will assume that the, the, uh, there, is, there exists a CFT, conformal field theory, that describes, for instance, the infrared behavior of the, the easing model. Okay. I'm not trying to, just to, to prove it, of course, it's just an assumption. So in such a theory, so the basic ingredient of such a theory will be correlation functions. of operators that you can assume they are like the scaling limit of certain observables defined on the lattice. But again, I'm not trying to prove that this, this limit is well defined. Um, so the assumption is that there exist uh, operators classified according to their uh, quantum numbers under the conformal group. So in particular, the conformal group is in D dimension is isomorphic to SOD plus one comma one in Euclidean D dimensions. And you can classify irreducible representations according to uh, the scaling dimension of the operator, delta, and uh, the irreducible representation under SOD rotation. So in three, in three dimension, that's just going to be an integer. I'm gonna call it L. Uh, so the, 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 the main ingredient will be these correlation functions of operators inserted at, at different points. Okay. And because you have a symmetry, this correlation function must, uh, uh, must be covariant under symmetry. So they, they have to transform in the appropriate way. And the nice, the nice uh, thing about conformal, conformal symmetry is that fixes for you the form of two-point functions and three-point functions. So two-point functions are fixed, meaning that you can redefine operators, so x1, x2, in a, in a, the in a, in a theory we are interested in, for instance, the easing model, you can, we assume that you can always redefine operators such that these uh, as diagonal in in operator space, and then there is uh, a factor which is completely fixed. So the dependence on the coordinate is completely fixed. I'm not going to write it. But just to know that you can show that it's, uh, the consistency of, of, of the symmetry implies that this is fixed. So that, that's weird. Fixed in terms of what? Well, the, 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 yeah, fixed in terms of the demand of the quantum numbers of the operator. So the dependence on the space-time coordinates is fixed in terms of uh, the quantum numbers. Uh, similarly, for three-point functions, now we don't have the freedom to redefine operators. So uh, this might Sorry. yes. Does this also depend on x1 minus x2? It yes. It, on yeah, it depends on, on actually on the modulus of x1 minus x2. Yeah, okay. yeah, no, 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 it depends, of course, by translation invariance, it only depends on the difference. Yeah. And, and by rotation, yeah. it, has to, it has to reproduce the tensor structure if there is one. I'm just trying to be sketchy. Okay. But yes, you can totally, this is totally fixed and totally known. And similarly for three-point functions, uh, the, uh, the request that this object transform in an appropriate way under conformal transformation implies that this is also fixed, more or less, 
up to a finite number of constants that depend on the representation of this operator. So depending on which representation you're choosing, you might have a finite number of constant, but the dependence on the coordinate is, is again fixed. Okay? And, this, and of course, it would depend on differences, and if there, if there are indices, I mean, if these objects are not scalars, this, ob, this quantity will have a tensor structure to reproduce. So, but this is also okay, up to certain number of, of constant that I will call lambda i, j, k, and then eventually there is more than one. So this number a goes from one to a certain number that depends on which representation you have, you have chosen. So that's for two-point function and three-point function. For four, starting from four-point function, the story becomes more complicated because now you don't have uh, enough power to completely fix the, 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 the dependence on space, on, on the coordinates. In particular, starting with four, uh, po four points, four different points, you can construct invariants. And since you can construct invariants, you can always multiply whatever you find by an invariant, and this object will transform in the same way. So that tells you that uh, four-point function you cannot completely fix. So we need another ingredient to, uh, to proceed further. And this other ingredient is going to be, again, an assumption. Uh, well, it's, an, it's not an assumption, but uh, you can take it as an assumption. The, ex the existence of an operator product expansion. Which is a statement that inside correlation functions, you can replace the product of two operators with an infinite uh, series of operators. So there's going to be a sum of, uh, that runs over, in principle, over the whole set of operators of your theory. Uh, if there are selection rules, perhaps the sum is restricted to a, to a subset. Uh, and then there will be the same constant that we had there appearing, i, j, k. So let me, call, let me write sum over k, lambda i, j, k, operator k. Of course, there's going to be, uh, there's gonna be a, a functions of x, 1, 2. To the appropriate dimension to reproduce the same, the same. Uh, so let me just write schematically like this. That's very schematic. Okay. Uh, let me just tell you that there is, there is such a uh, qu such a uh, such quantity. Do so you have upper indices for our area? Yeah. If there are indices, then you have to contract the indices. It, it, it's much more complicated than this. Okay. Uh, if, if I had to write it, uh, it would take me half an hour just to Maybe explain everything. So, yeah, this, is a, this can be evaluated, for instance, in X2. But no, not necessarily, but nevertheless. So the idea is that inside correlation functions, you can take a pair of operators and replace it with an infinite sum of operators. Okay? And this, uh, while in a quantum field theory, this is not... It's a just an asymptotic expansion. In a conformal field theory, it has a finite radius of convergence. Okay? So it really gives, uh, it really holds at finite distance between these two operators. And so the idea is that by using this operator product expansion now, you can reduce any correlation function of more than three objects to eventually infinitely many uh, correlation function with smaller operators, which you know. So iteratively, uh, you can always, in principle, if you know all the operators and you can also know all this coefficient lambda, you can compute everything. It might be a very complicated task, but in principle, you can do that. Uh, yes? But this means that even those relations you can reduce to a single operator. Very good, yes. So if you, if you do this in a three point function uh, and you use the fact that uh, two point functions are diagonal, then only one term will survive, and that's in fact the reason why this lambda is the same as, as that lambda. All right. 
Am I doing it on time? Okay. Very good. So this brings me to the uh, last uh, ingredient that I will need, which is the application of all this in all, all, all this point to the case, the simplest case of interest, which is four point functions. <clears throat> so let me consider a four point function of identical scalar operator. So I'll use the same operator inserted at four different points. And then, okay, by assumption I have this operator product expansion, so I'll use it. And for instance, I can take the first two, and I can also take the second two. Okay, there is a region where both operator, operator product expansion converge, so I can, I can use that. And if you do that, okay, uh, in principle you would have a, a double sum, but because uh, two-point functions are diagonal, there is only one sum that survives. So there is a sum over k, let's call it. Uh, and I'm, I'm being very schematic again. I will write, so for each of these uh, operators, there is an OP coefficient. And the OP coefficient depends on the operator OK that appears. So let me call it OK. And it's square because it, the, I'm doing it twice. And then there is a structure that I will graphically denote like this. meaning that I'm, I'm merging point one and two, and three and four. And this quantity is called, a, uh, well, with abuse of notation, it's a conformal block. It's not exactly a conformal block, but. It's proportional to what is called a conformal block. So a conformal block is uh, a quantity that is completely fixed by conformal symmetry, is a function. And it depends on the, uh, the quantum number, num quantum numbers of the operator exchanged. It depends on eventually on the dimension of the, operator, the external operators. And it's it basically it's known. Okay, you can you can find this 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 this, uh, this function as as a solution of a differential equation. In fact, in in two dimension is completely known. In four dimension is exactly known. <laughs> In odd dimension, it's not known. So, if some, some, any of the expert in the audience uh, wants to give a contribution to the field, that's an open problem. But nevertheless, it's a it's a quantity that, in principle, is completely fixed by conformal symmetry. So, and it depends on certain combination of of the uh, of the external uh, points. On the other hand, okay. Yes. It doesn't depend on the operator? It also depends on the operator. And on the k. Yeah. On the other hand, I could have taken the OPE in a different way, provided that there is, uh, there is a also, also that expansion converges. And there are configuration of the four points where both the one that I, that I wrote and, for instance, this one converge simultaneously. So I can also do that expansion. And if I do that now, this will be a sum. Well, it's a sum of, on the same k for because this part, for because of this particular choice. There are the same OP coefficient. These lambda are called OP coefficients. But now these conformal blocks are different. And schematically, you can write like that. Uh, sorry, let me. Well, now you're merging point one and four, and two with three. And here you're still exchanging. Okay. Why don't you get commutator fitters? Um, why don't I take... Uh, why don't you, like, I mean... If it converges the other way around, you want to shift yes. the orders, then you should get the same yeah, function, but commutator should be yeah. there. 
Yeah, so the point is you're, you're taking, um, so I, I told you that um, the, it, the ordering is dictated by the quantization you're making, okay? So in principle, if you're doing radial quantization, this should be radial order. But the, radial quanti the quantization depends on the point you're choosing for the, for the, for the quantization. So uh, you can choose a point of quantization where this, or this, this ordering is it's correct. Or, or if you think, of, or if you think in another way, for instance, if you if you think of this correlator as believing in Lorentzian si si signature, uh, space-like separation where operator comm commutes, uh, it doesn't matter where you put them. For instance, I mean that you can justify this. Uh, but the important point is that these two expansions they're both valid, they're both convergent, but they are not equal term by term. Okay, so this is, uh, this is another conformal block with a slightly different dependence on the external coordinate. Uh, and it's not equal, trivially equal to this one. So in this sum, there must be a conspiracy of terms such that this equality is realized. So this is called crossing symmetry. Or crossing equation. And because the functions in the parentheses are known, this is literally a constraint on the, the set of operators that appear in the sum and the coefficient, which are positive. You can prove that this quantity is positive. So the coefficients are, are real. So it's a condition on, so this equation is a functional equation on which operator enter in the sum and the value of the OP coefficient. And so as before, we would like to study this equation and check when it can be satisfied and when it can, cannot. Um, okay. So how do we study this? Okay. Let me give a pictorial interpretation. Well, I, I actually don't need to, dig, to give a pictorial interpretation. Let me try to do the following. Let me try to explain the logic of how we study the feasibility of this equation. So to study when, for which value of operators appearing in the sum and for which value of OP coefficient this, this crossing equation admits a solution, we can proceed in the following way. Um, suppose you can find uh, there exists a linear functional alpha that uh, acts on this on this on the space of uh, difference of 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 those, so such that uh, and and returns a linear uh, a linear number, so a real number, so alpha of, uh, say, this quantity minus this quantity uh, is a real number. And also, alpha commutes with, uh, with a sum, so that you can really take the alpha, the action of alpha term by term, okay? And most importantly, you want this alpha to satisfy the following condition. Alpha acting on this difference is non-negative non for all <coughs> operator k okay, appearing in the sum. And uh, for instance, you can choose one operator. So alpha on um, on, on one particular term of the sum equal to a positive number, say one, for uh, a certain operator, let's call it O star. Okay, for, it could be the identity, for instance, or whatever operator. You, you pick one. 
you pick one out of the sum, and you declare, you require that the action of this function on that is a strictly positive number, and then you, uh, you require that the action on everything else is positive. So if you do find such a, if function, such a function or such linear functional exists, <laughs> sorry, I didn't say linear. Well, it's also positive, right? Strictly on zero, yeah. Well, it's an operator that you know appears there. So, or you want to be to be there. <laughs> uh, for it. Well, for instance, one operator that we know appears is the identity. So let's say the identity. The identity operator always appear in the OPE because otherwise the two-point function of the operator will be zero. So that's one. Uh, that's one thing. So if we do find such a such a linear functional, uh, then if uh, by acting with this linear functional on the uh, crossing equation, you would get a contradiction. Mm -hmm. Which means, okay, if you do find such a function, it means that the choice that you have made for, for the operator appearing in the sum, it's inconsistent with crossing equation. Mm -hmm. So if it exists, if alpha exists, then, uh, the set of k that we have chosen, uh, that we have selected to be part of the sum, it's inconsistent with, with, with cross. Um, so, and of course, the, the smaller is this set, the easier would be to find the functional. If you, if you allow for any operator any possible operator entering this sum, definitely you shouldn't find a functional because we know examples of theory that satisfy the, the crossing equation. So there must be solution, perhaps trivial, but there are. Uh, and then the more you restrict the set of, of, of operators appearing in, the, in this sum, the easier should be to find the functional. It's not guaranteeing, guaranteed that it exists, but it should be easier and easier. So perhaps there will be a transition between the region where, where you do find the function and the region where you don't find the function. So with this in mind, we can try to, to study uh, a very simple problem, okay? And, uh, okay, simple problem. And we can do this in any dimension, so let's start in two dimensions where we know a lot of things. So the, the problem that I'm going to discuss is the following. Take an operator that I will call with uh, uh, some, uh, anticipating a little bit the result, I will call it sigma. It's a scalar operator. And it has some dimension, which I can call delta sigma. And then uh, I can do everything that I said. I will find the crossing equation. And in this crossing equation, there will be a, uh, sum of an operator appearing in the OPE sigma sigma. So let me specify a little bit how the, uh, the, um, the OPE of sigma with itself will look like. So sigma with sigma, this is the symbol of OPE. It will contain the identity operator we said and then, eventually, there will be scalars. Let me call the first scalar, the scalar with the smallest dimension, epsilon, with dimension delta epsilon, which by definition is the, is the scalar with the smallest dimension in this OPE. And then eventually, there are other, infinitely many other stuff. So there will be scalars with higher dimension, there will be non-scalars, whatever you want. And so the, que the first question one can ask is, Given delta sigma, how large can be delta epsilon? So how, how, how high can I, push, can I push, sorry, all the scalars in this OPE and still be consistent with cross? So let me try to, do, to draw this, uh, this plot, delta sigma <coughs> versus delta epsilon. 
This is a plane. In this plane, there are theories that we know, so we should place them. For instance, we know in two dimensions there are the minimal models. The minimal models have a scalar operator. We know the OP, so we know the dimensions. We know the dimension of the operator appearing in, the, in this OP. So we can start writing crosses. So there is the easing model. There is the uh, tricritical, I think. There is the POTS model. And, also, and there, they accumulate eventually. Uh, so this is 1, 8. This is one. Then the, eventually you can, you can take other fields in, within a minimal model, which is not, so this would be, this would correspond to phi one, two, right? You can take other fields and do the same game and there will be other crosses, something like this. So these are theories that you know exist, so you better not exclude them. Uh, and then you can start playing the game, okay? You, we can look for it. You can fix delta, delta, delta sigma. You know exactly the functions. You can, you can choose an answer for the linear functionals. And you can, you, you can, look, you can try to look for linear functionals. Of course, you, you, shouldn't, you, you don't have to do it by hand. There are algorithms to do that. They're completely, they're not simulations, they're completely uh, algorithmic algorithm, okay, deterministic algorithm. And the, the idea is that this solve, finding this alpha corresponds to solving a convex optimization problem. So there are algorithms to do that. And then eventually you will find that for any delta sigma, there is only a maximal delta epsilon allowed. You, you cannot push it too much, uh, this, the dimension of this, otherwise you will not be able to satisfy crossing equations. So there is a, a, a an allowed region and it is allowed region, and there is a boundary of, between these two, and the boundary goes like this. Sorry. Of course, the easing model is inside. So interestingly enough, the, all the minimal models saturate the, bound, the boundary, so they are in, inside the allowed region, but they, are, they occupy a special place. They are on the boundary, and. Uh, uh, and the easing model instead occupy even more special place because it sits at a, a, a king, a sort of discontinuity in the boundary of the allowed region. So this was basically a simple example that you can play with no assumptions whatsoever about the, the theory that you're trying to, no physical assumptions uh, about the theory you want to describe. It's just exploring the space of consistent conformal field theories defined as theories that satisfy all the axioms that I listed, and crossing equations, okay? So is everything forbidden except that line? Yes, yeah, sorry, you're, so this is allowed, oh, okay. and this is disallowed. So delta epsilon has to be smaller than this line. Uh, can we, m while I answer the question, can we switch on the projector? Yes. Do you get additional constraints from unitarity or reflection positive? Very good. So I, I didn't specify it. I should have. Uh, unitarity plays a major role here in two ways. First, uh, it's telling you that these, are, well, these are coefficients are positive. But it also restricts the allowed values of dimensions because there are certain representation of conformance symmetry that uh, contains negative norm states in a sense. So you, you can, you're not allowed to introduce them in the game. So this does, this, all this, this machinery does not apply to theories that are non-unitary or non-reflection positive in, in Euclid. I mean, I mean, you mean Yang Li? No, no, the minimal brother M equal one and two. M equal, so there is the easing model. This is three, four, four, three. No, no, the, the, the ones which are before. They are non-unitary. Non well, they are non-unitary. I know, so they, they don't show up. Yeah, they don't show up. This bound does not apply on those. I understand, but where are they in this? Oh, yeah, they, they are like, you have to continue. This line is an analytic continuation of the minimal model, so they all lie on this line. So they have to go the crossing way. So hmm? Crossing way. It crosses, uh, it crosses, I think it crosses. Oh, here. Yeah. Uh, so this is, okay, I, I don't remember, this is 1, 8, one, and then the other point where I know it's one half two. 
So you, you can get the slope. All right. So let me. All right. So this is a better, uh, a better plot, uh, a better version of that plot. And importantly, okay, uh, we didn't use Virasoro to do that. Uh, despite the minimal models are, have been obtained using the full power of Virasoro symmetry, this plot does not use it. So, which means that gives, this gives hope that the same would, would work in high dimensions. And in fact, we try to do the same, the same high dimension. So let's try to play the same game in high dimension, in three dimensions. The only change is basically in the form of the conformal block. Okay? This is the only thing that changes. And the unitarity bounds, meaning which representations are allowed. Um, so again, there is a, the blue region is allowed, the white region is disallowed, and as before, there is a, a kinky shape which signals uh, the presence of something, and if you compare this point with the expected critical exponents of the easing model, you will find that it matches kind of uh, perfectly well within the approximation of this, of this plot. So, but again, in this plot there was no assumption, no, no physics, physical assumption. So for instance, we know various things about the easing model. We know how many relevant deformation it has. We haven't used that so far. So to do that, uh, you have to impose that epsilon, for instance, is the only relevant uh, operator that appears in this OPE. So, this is the temperature deformation, it's the only deformation. It's a Z2 even deformation. Sigma is the spin field, is the only Z2 odd deformation. Okay, it's the mag magnetic field, corresponds to adding a magnetic field. And there are no other deformation you can possibly add to the, uh, the theory. So if we impose that, meaning, so that corresponds to restricting further the possible operator appearing in this sum over K. And Definitely, if you restrict the, um, the, the operator appearing, it's easier to find the functional, which means that the constraint will, will become stronger and the, re the allowed region should become smaller. So if we do, we did that, and so under this assumption that there are only two relevant deformations, we can ask what are the allowed values for delta sigma and delta epsilon. And in doing that, now, the allowed region shrinks, there is a, an isolated region and a, con a bigger region. So we call this an, an insula, an island, sorry, and this is a peninsula. And uh, so this was a very important result back in 2014 uh, because it shows that by simple, well, by we only two, injecting only two physical assumptions, you can restrict the value of delta sigma and delta epsilon, which are related to the critical exponent eta and, and nu to a closed region. The, a CFT, a putative CFT corresponding to the three-dimensional easy model can only live here inside. And okay, so for now this, uh, uh, this, this island is pretty large, but as a, if you remember, uh, even in this very simple example, you could, you could always do better by increasing the, the power of your computer. And so, over the years, we pushed these the numerics, we pushed the power of our clusters, we spent some money, and, uh, and we obtained a prediction that compared to the Monte Carlo in the, with, this, with this power, okay? So right now we have, um, we have a prediction for the critical exponent. They have any conformal field theory in three dimension with only two relevant deformation, one z2 even, one z2 odd, must live here inside. This is the Monte Carlo prediction, this box, okay? Uh, and this is the bootstrap prediction. So you see it's quite, uh, quite uh, astonishing, the precision that we are able to get. And, uh, and I should, should stress that these are not, so this, these bounds are rigorous in the sense that very much like this one, there is no simulation involved. It's just a, a rigorous bound. You can, Perhaps there is some fuzziness in the boundary due to the precision of your of your machine, but you can always increase the precision. Just, yes. So Monte Carlo, it's like confidence region, right? Exactly. It's like with nine yeah, that, that's also another thing. It, yeah, it's really it's like rigorous. Mm -hmm. Outside of this blue region, I can provide you the functional, the linear functional that gives you the contradiction. 
up to a certain machine precision, that I can always improve if you're not satisfied. <laughs> or we can, we can also make it even, instead of requiring that the, the, the contradict, yeah, I mean, I, I can provide you the, the I can provide you the, the, the linear function with 400 digit precision. So, yes? What, what happened to the other part? Yeah, the other part, it doesn't fit in this plot. It, it's still there, it's been pushed a little bit further, but still there, it doesn't disappear. Of course. So the ON models don't lie here, they lie in the other part, do they? The ON models, um, yeah. So the ON models, right now I'm not assuming ON symmetry. And if I don't assume ON symmetry, uh, there are scalars, for instance, the one model. If I just look at it, I look at, at it as a theory with only has Z2 symmetry would contain more relevant deformation. So they are, re they are removed by my assumption because they contain more relevant deformation. Of course, these relevant deformations are non-singlet. So if I use the, ON, the full ON symmetry, I can distinguish them. In fact, we have a plot similar to this one for any N, in a sense. Well, n1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 20. And in fact, I like the comment by Jean this morning that he said, for n equal 20, the larger n symmetry, the, the larger predictions start uh, being consistent. Indeed, we can see that inside our ON20 island, there is the prediction of large n. What, what happens in four dimensions? I'm getting to that, if I, yeah, in, in a few minutes. Well, in four, five, in four dimensions, there is no fixed point, so you don't find any kink. But just to anticipate, in any intermediate dimension, although it shouldn't work, because the theory is non-unitary, still works, and you find kinks. Just that I'm certain to have understood. So for the conformal blocks, you said that you don't have exact formulas, but you, you know how to control rigorously the error. Yes. That's, uh, okay. Yes. In three, in three dimension, yes. In two and four dimension, I, I do have exact form. Well, you do have exact form, meaning that you have some convergent series. Yeah, there is a convergent series, and you can truncate it uh, whenever you're satisfied with the precision. Yeah. Okay. So, in fact, you can get more rigorous bounds on any, well, on many quantities. This is a very nice result by Martin, which is here in Paris. Uh, and you see that there are some of them, so this parameter lambda computes, it's the ana analog of this parameter k, controls the, the complexity of our, of our method, and some of them, like this, uh, this four, this four, the first four have been computed at very high precision, the other one has been computed at very small precision, but there are many of them, like the central charge of the theory, the dimension of the next scalar, the dimension of the first spin two operator after the stress tensor, and so on. These lambdas are OP coefficient and so on and so forth. And just by comparison, I asked myself, well, I asked Ning, uh, my collaborator, to, to do the similar game in two dimensions. Even though we know exactly the, the solution, we can, we can see which preci precision we would get if we play the same game. And you see you, it's comparable, more or less. Uh, with, a small, with a smaller complex, uh, co complex problem, we can get a similar precision. Um, Okay, how much time do I have? Seven minutes, okay. I just want to mention that uh, whenever the allowed region is very, very small, uh, you can get an estimate of the, of the spectrum by looking at uh, solution of the truncated crossing equation. And this, of course, is non-rigorous, but still gives us uh, an information about the theory. And over the years, people have computed a lot of stuff. <laughs> Okay, so these are all predictions of for all operators that we have. Um, and interestingly enough, we have also understood the structure of these operators because um, there are analytic results that predict that operators at large spin organize in families, and these families are called rigid trajectories, and the dimension, uh, it's an analytic function of spin, at, at large spin it has this behavior. So, and this, co and this coefficient here that I didn't write, you can compute it from uh, low energy, for, from low dimensional data. And you can compare this, this table that I listed before with the expected behavior and it matches perfectly. Okay, mm, I'll skip this. Um, so what have we learned so far? We have learned that uh, the Ising model seems to be an isolated 
point in, in, in conformal field theory space, um, it occupies a special place. Okay? It was on the boundary of the Laos region, which tells us uh, that it's already special. On top of that, it was on a kink. And by studying precisely how the solution looks like uh, in, in whenever you are on the boundary, whenever you, are, you have a kink, we discovered that it has some special feature compared to a general solution of crossing. In particular, the spectrum seems to be sparser. So there are less operators than you would expect in a generic, generic solution. So one, one, uh, one goal, well, one dream would be to use this decoupling of state, very much you, you do in two dimensions, to uh, perhaps solve the theory exactly. But this is very uh, dreamy. We also understood how uh, low dimensional operators are related to rigid trajectories, and perhaps you can, we can use this as consistency condition of the theory. So this has been used already numerically by imposing consistency condition, and has also been implemented in recently on, on an algorithm. And in epsilon expansion, this has been used also to fix the epsilon expansion coefficient, literally by demanding that operator organize a rigid trajectory. And there have been results up to fourth order in epsilon expansion for the for easy model, and then uh, to epsilon order epsilon for mixed uh, correlator. And we also understood that it looks like that well we haven't understood, but it looks like that the, the, the easy model is the among at least in a certain range is the theory with the smaller central charge. So. Yeah. Okay. It means that among all possible conformal, it's in, well, in the unit of a free, the central charge of a free scalar, that's like, the, if that is one, the, the central charge. Beyond. Hmm? It's above or beyond one. It's beyond. Sorry, it, it's, it's below the central charge of a free scalar. But slightly smaller. Do you want to say it's smallest? Oh, yeah, sorry, smallest. Sorry, thanks, Slava. <laughs> yeah, that's a typo. Um, yeah, sorry. Um, okay, well, let me conclude with a, a very nice observation, I think. So most of the features that we have discussed seem to be a consequence or seem to be inherited by <coughs> properties of the easing model in two dimensions or in four minus apps. And, okay, it, as we heard this morning, uh, the easing model can be continued in a sense, okay, uh, more formally, you can analytically continue correlation function at least of scalar operators because the conformal blocks, they have an analytic, an analytic dependence on space-time dimension. So for that, for that regard, if you also analytically continue dimension and, and OPE coefficient, you can literally follow the correlation function from four dimension to down to two dimensions. And uh, there was a question before if we can, we can do the same game in, in any dimension, and we can. So these dots here correspond to the kink, the kinks that you would find in various dimensions, while this red prediction is the prediction that was obtained by using general results, uh, using resummation of epsilon expansion. So they, they also perfectly agree. Um, and then, okay, since we, I, I show you that you can extract the spectrum of three-dimensional CFT, perhaps you can also extract the spectrum of those and follow the theory across the bench. So this is work in progress, so I'll just show you a preview uh, by these people, which we managed to, to extract the spectrum, these dots are, spec are dimensional operators across dimension from four to down to 2.6, and you can follow the operators, and you can, you can find, for instance, there, there are nice, nice things like level repulsion, uh, there is a, for some operator, there is a very impressive agreement with the, these lines are the epsilon expansion prediction at, at first order. What are you plotting now here? Yeah, so these lines are the epsilon expansion prediction for, for operators in the theory, in the in four minus epsilon, at, at linear order. So in principle, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be valid, but for some, for, for some operator, it's actually very precise while the dots are the spectrum extracted using this, uh, this method. Of, it's, not, it's a non-rigorous spectrum. Okay. Well, it's just well, it's not the what is on your horizontal yeah. collection. Oh, this is delta. This is the, 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 dimension, the scaling dimension of operators appearing <laughs> in the, present in the easing model. 
while this one is uh, the space-time dimension. To 2.5. Yeah, it goes from yeah. 4 to 2.6, yes. So the easy model, the real easy model would be this one, okay? And, okay, so and zooming in, for instance, you see that these operators that start at 6 and at 8, uh, they get closer and closer and closer and then they repel, which is uh, something very nice. Okay, uh, I think um, um, I'll stop here. Thank you very much for the attention. So we had quite a few questions, but we have time for one or two more. Could you show the numbers you have calculated? Can you just tell what is alpha specific heat index? Oh. These ones? Yeah, but can you somehow say so these are these deltas are the dimension. So this is the spin field. Oh, okay, but what is alpha? alpha? Oh, uh, this one. Specific heat, no specific alpha. heat index. From here you should you can calculate that one. You mean the linear function? No, specific heat index. Oh, the specific heat. Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, it's a combination of this of. Yeah, I don't remember the exact expression. So the eta exponent is one half plus this over two. The new exponent is one minus, divided by three minus this. Uh, so I don't remember which is which, but yeah. They, they are related to these two dimensions. The, the usual critical exponent, eta and nu. Well, I, I wanted to comment that I think it's very good to decide that we didn't track alpha. Oh, West alpha, yeah, alpha didn't. The, the, lesson of CFT, of the lesson of CFT is that you should forget about alpha. Alpha it was 20th century. <laughs> this no, deltas, no. deltas are the fundamental quantities that everyone should be thinking about. Okay, but today in the morning we have listened uh, well, where the alpha was. That was 20th century. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, the scaling relations are a prediction of, of coming from a quantum field, underlining quantum field. We don't want to think about that. We want to think about a, an abstract object that is defined. Per 20th century, we turn to one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, you, yes. Uh, so, <laughs> so you, there are some conjectures, you, you didn't mention them, but there are some conjectures about uh, exact formulas for delta sigma in terms of, in terms of yes. functions. Yes, yeah, exactly. Can you comment Jump what is the prospect of verifying this conjecture right. by so, adding a few more digits? Yeah, very good. So. If you look at this, these numbers, okay, and then you tr you, you go on, on, on the internet and there are websites. <laughs> well, there are algorithms that basically gives you uh, plausible functions uh, in terms of ratios of gamma functions that give you this number. And right now, there is only 10-ish that looks reasonable, okay? The other one are just uh, crazy expressions. Instead, 10, 10-ish, they look like a ratio of gamma 112 over gamma something. Uh, so if you increase by one more digit, then you will shrink basically. You can, you can, you're able to distinguish them and see if there is one uh, com consistent. But, so is anyone working on this direction? Yeah, I'm working on this direction in the sense that, <laughs> so what do we do, the question perhaps is what do we do next, okay? What do we do next is either, Either you, you keep cons considering more and more correlation functions. For instance, it's expected that the stress tensor should play a major role. So for instance, what I'm doing now is I'm considering correlation function involving also the stress tensor and sigma and epsilon, and see if this shrinks even more the, the, the island. Hopefully one digit. Yes. So CFTs have become also a little fashionable in four dimensions because of the ADS CFT correspondence. Yeah. If you apply this in four dimensions, can you solve it? Right, so for instance, the, the, the most, the most uh, studied example of, of the ADS CFT is the duality between n equal force to young mills and string theory. So this, this method can be applied to n equal four and has been applied, I would say applied it, and there, there are results. In particular, you can match. So there was a, the problem there is that it's a gauge theory and on top of that, it also has a, co a conformal manifold. So you have to specify where you are. 
Uh, and uh, this has been done only recently. So if you manage to specify, for instance, if you specify that you are weak coupling, you can match with perturbative computation and it looks like it agrees. Uh, then you can take other limits and it looks like it agrees. Uh, so it's getting better and better. Uh, the hope would be also to study conformal window of QCD, but uh, that's a little bit ahead in the future. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, what's the meaning of, of your result for non-integral dimensions if you don't have unitarity? I mean, are you Maybe. saying that you assume that lambda squared is positive, but unality continues blocks in dimension? Or what? Right. So there was a very nice paper of, of Slava showing that this theory are non-unitary, but the non-unitarity shows up at very, very high dimension. So there, these are the, un, the, uh, the states that becomes non-unitary, they are very, very high in dimension. And one thing that, the, one of the reasons why this, ob, this, this, this business works very, very well is that you're not sensitive to high energy operators uh, because they, the couple, well, they're so exponentially suppressed. So this non-unitarity, basically, we are not able to see it. But, so, which means that the, there is a solution of crossing, which is fake, Okay, it's not a real solution of crossing because the theory does not exist, but it looks like it's very close to the real one. And eventually, by pushing the, the, this method more and more to high precision, to high power, you should be able to see that the theory does not exist. But so far, we, we haven't reached that. So we are, there is a regime where you can study the theory F if it was unitary without realizing that it's non-unitary. Uh, but then if you push it too much, perhaps you, you're gonna see that it's non-unitary and everything is up. So the, 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 the island that I show you will disappear. It will shrink to zero, but so far we are. So it's, it's a bit mysterious why it works. Well, it's a bit of a hocus pocus, but uh, it, it, it seems to give uh, right, uh, correct results. And it's due to the fact that, of this exponential suppression of operators. We are the very brief. What's the meaning of the prime in this? Graph? Prime means neck. Well, the, the the unprimed are the first operator in. So epsilon is the smallest dimension scalar. Epsilon prime is the next one. So sigma is the smallest dimension. So the operator are order uh, according to their dimension, and prime means that it's the next one. So t stress tensor would be t. The operator with spin two, and after it, it's t prime. And so on and so forth. I guess uh, the question is that in 2D, epsilon prime doesn't exist, but. In 2D, epsilon prime does not exist, yes. But in 3D, yes. Okay. Uh, we'll stop here with the questions because we're already running a bit late. And we will start in two minutes with Richard Kenyon's talk.